Uh, so we should be live, just so you know. Did you guys grab a water? If you want a water, I think I Did you want to? You got a water. Okay. Oh, don't even tell me they're tired. Oh, what? Open the widget. Open the widget. Yes, you can just shut off the speaker. 
Okay. So yeah, we just shut off the speakers and the computers and we can start with it. Okay, fantastic. Hopefully this is gonna work. Uh, sure. Here, you know what? I'm going to give you my phone to somebody else and then you tell me. Okay, hold on. You guys are going to see, listen to this is happy. We're going to see if I speak and he gets a lot of people picking up. Or did she hang up? <laughs> Hello? Can you hear us on the live stream? And hear me now? That's a good test. Okay. <laughs> Keep talking. This is a test. We've never done a live stream symposium before, so we're being talked through it. Can you still hear me? We're good. Yay! Tell Mrs. Happy what you said next. Okay. I see some people coming in, so I'm just going to give us a minute for everybody to get settled, and then we'll begin. See the bottom right? <laughs> you can watch mine. I 
That's not him, right? Good luck next year. 
She will be attending Worcester Poly Institute and majoring in environmental engineering. Sydney is the first graduate of this three-year program. I would now like to call up Ms. Caitlin Stern to introduce her mentor and our keynote speaker, Mr. Jason Ajak from Restore Native Plants in Oakland, New Jersey. Caitlin? Good evening. Jason graduated from Clarkson, Clarkson University with a master's degree in basic science with a concentration in wildlife conservation. He has helped to identify 25 state endangered plant and animal species, as well as over 100 species of local songbirds while working at Restore Native Plants. Tonight, he is going to be speaking about how native plants are the ecological basis upon which all life forms depend, and how human dominated landscapes no longer support functioning ecosystems, and how individuals can change this process. Jason? Can you all hear me? Because I prefer to do it without the mic, honestly. It's a little bit awkward. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, so first off, I just want to thank everybody for having me here tonight. It really is an honor. And I just want to congratulate Caitlin and everybody else here as well. I know just how hard they've worked uh, in the hot days, lots of days in, in the labs. And with everything going on with COVID as well, it must have been very, very challenging for everybody. So I just want to again congratulate all the students. So I'll start with a little anecdote. And that's um, growing up in the streets of West Milford, I've actually been exploring nature for just about as long as I can remember. And one of my earliest and most fond memories was walking in the woods, scavenging for blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, all things we would bake into pies. There were endless patches of berry bushes everywhere. And more often than not, we'd actually return with way more than we could actually put into the pies. So in many ways, this experience and all the other experiences that I shared with my good friend growing up in these woods of West Milford really kind of shaped my love for nature and the path that I chose in life today. So, why do I choose to open with this? I'm not here to tell you how much I love berry picking, although that's true. So really, I chose to open with this because today, the picture is unfortunately very, very different. So those days of berry picking 20 years ago, which is really just a very, very small time on the ecological block. And that time, our nonprofit, Restore Native Plants, has actually acquired the very same property, this one, that I used to walk in the woods with as a kid for the sole purpose of preservation. Our first return back to this property was really nothing short of shocking. Where there were once blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, as far as the eye can see, now there was just this, phragmites everywhere an invasive species of plant that completely took over the area. And not just that, there was wisteria, barberry, Japanese knotweed, all where these very bushes used to stand. All of these bushes that used to provide food for myself and for wildlife, they were now gone and replaced with this monoculture plant that had next to no wildlife value. So, what has happened in this small corner of West Milford, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, all grew up very close to here, it's a microcosm of what's taking place on a global scale. All of us in this growing time of social justice are familiar with the effects of discrimination. Racism, gender discrimination, discrimination based on sexual preference, the list goes on. Unfortunately, too few of us are actually familiar with an equally prevalent form of discrimination. And this is one that has actually decimated our biodiversity and the ecosystem in which we live. And I'm talking about speciesism. 
So much like all other forms of discrimination, all of us, everybody in this room, everybody in the community, we must all come together, identify the problem, create a plan, and start to take action. And that's what I'm going to help us all do today. And it's easy enough to understand the conflict that arises between humans and between nature as human populations continue to grow. We bring to every encounter with nature an ancient struggle for our own survival and have being, uh, become accustomed to meeting our needs without any compromise whatsoever. If we need to find a place to live, we simply take it, all of it. And if that means filling in a breeding ground for amphibians or cutting down trees, then so be it. We have come to feel completely justified in sending the plant and animal species that we depend on um, and off of these habitats off to make do someplace else. This has become the very uh, definition of speciesism. Let's be honest, nobody is going to choose a tadpole over, over a human when presented with this choice. Partly because until relatively recently, there has always been someplace else for nature to thrive. This way of thinking can no longer continue. We can no longer take nature's persistence for granted and regulate nature to parks and preserves, believing that it will always be there for us, for future gener uh, generations when we need it. We can no longer replace the native vegetation in our neighborhoods with foreign and invasive species and remain confident that our native species will just survive somewhere else. Simply put, we're all running out of time and we have run out of natural areas. We have taken absolutely all of it. Ecologists estimate that out of all of the natural land that the United States contained prior to its colonization, only three to five percent remains undisturbed for plants and animals. In other words, we have taken and modified for our own use between 95 and 97 percent of all land in the lower 48 states. Now, as far as our wildlife is concerned, we have shrunk the continental United States to 1 20th its original size. And because the remaining undisturbed land for wildlife are not contiguous habitats, but rather scattered islands like that, the effective size of undisturbed land area remaining for plants, for mammals, reptiles, birds, and invertebrates of North America is actually even smaller. As a result, within our lifetimes, we will have lost 95% of the species that initially inhabited this area. There is, however, a reasonably simple solution out of this catastrophe, so long as we act before the extinction depth, uh, depth that we created is realized. These predictions of mass extinction are based on the assumption that the vast majority of plants and animals cannot coexist with humans. Um, and it's really the idea that's driving this whole idea of speciesism. In fact, evidence actually suggests that the opposite is true. Most plant and animal species can actually coexist quite nicely with humans if just their most basic ecological needs were met. The reality is though that this concept of speciesism, uh, because of this, humans are separated from the ecosystem in which they live when in reality we're an integral cog in this machine of ecology. Native plant and animal species could thrive sustainably alongside humans if we would just take the time and the effort to design our living spaces to accommodate them. And in too many places we remove the food, the shelter, the nesting grounds, all those things that are needed by most species and are haste to make the best parking lots big shopping malls, lawns, ball fields. However, in no place does it have to be that way. We have excluded other species from our living spaces through thoughtlessness rather than through need. It's not only possible, but it's actually highly desirable from a human perspective to create living spaces that are themselves functioning, sustainable ecosystems with a high species diversity. And in this way, native plants are the key to planting the seed for a healthy environment. Now, when we make the decision to garden and landscape with native plants, we're also by proxy making this decision to landscape in the name of insect diversity. 
because by and large, people know next to nothing about the most diverse group of organisms to ever evolve, these insects. And what they do know, well, it comes from negative encounters with just a few species of biting flies, mosquitoes, stinging wasps, crop developing, uh, devouring caterpillars. This nearly universal animosity towards insects is seriously misplaced. Of the estimated 4 million insect species on this earth, roughly only 1% of these species actually interact with humans in negative ways. So what about the other 99%, right? Well, the other 99% of these species, they pollinate plants, they return the nutrients tied up in dead plants and animals back to the soil, and they provide food either directly or indirectly for most other animals. If all insects were to disappear, our own extinction as humans would not be far behind. Humans need healthy insect populations to ensure our own survival. It's no wonder then that landscaping for native plants, and as a result, for insect species, is critical to the beginning of the process to restore the environment. So, so far if I've convinced you that there is value in having native plants in your landscape, then I'm happy to have accomplished at least half of my goal. Now the other half is to motivate everybody here to take action. The more native plants that you incorporate into your landscape or your garden, the healthier the species throughout your entire neighborhood is going to be. But how does one actually go about changing a landscape that's completely dominated by invasive plant species to one that's dominated by native species? How can we achieve the landscape look that we've become accustomed to and found through ornamental species that we've pulled throughout the world using only local plants? Do we have to abandon what may have been your primary motivation for gardening in the first place to create an artistic or an aesthetic environment for your property in order to create a landscape whose main purpose is to support wildlife? These are all valid and admittedly difficult questions to answer. And similar to our world being in the midst of a renaissance in these social justice movements that we're all familiar with, we're also on the cusp of a paradigm, uh, a paradigm shift rather, in landscape architecture. Through the use of native plants, we can at least as the first wave of gardeners and landscapers begin to venture forth and will be pioneers uh, who will pave the way for the rest of us. And yet, while us pioneers are busy fine-tuning the use of natives in our commercial and residential environments, there's a few simple approaches to getting started that I can share with you today. Now, first off, the question probably on everybody's mind, how much is this going to cost me? When starting this process, we have to keep in mind that we don't need to incorporate a slash and burn approach uh, towards these non-natives and invasives that are on your property. So simply put, there's no reason to take on this entire project in one mass planting, nor is there a need to spend thousands of dollars on new plants, especially in one sitting. Now, what we can do is we can increase the proportion of native plant species in your garden in two ways, with really a minimum of disruption and without destroying what's already there on your property. First off, when a non-native species dies, such as uh, this uh, non-native wisteria or this non-native butterfly bush, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with, uh, what you can do is you can replace it to, uh, with one of its native counterparts. So for example, you can, um, you can replace an exotic wisteria with an American wisteria, or you can replace a non-native butterfly bush with this native button bush. And what you would do in that situation is you would take into account the habitat, the approximate size, all things to take, in, uh, to take into consideration when you would normally be gardening. Now a second approach to working with natives in your landscape is to redi redesign small patches of your existing landscape, or even better, just creating a brand new planting on the edge uh, or behind your existing garden, or in an area that's currently lawn. Using this approach, you can still start from scratch, but you don't have to work around your old designs. And speaking of lawns, are you willing to trade in some of your lawn space for native tree species? Maybe a small lot. 
Most lawns can actually support many more trees than they currently do, particularly around the borders of the property, without even losing that open field near the house that many people enjoy. Now, interestingly enough, evolutionary psychologists believe that humans actually like spreading lawns that you see in really affluent areas uh, because, you know, for the most part, in the past, we liked to see hunters, predators, other threats were coming to attack us. In the old days, we were preyed upon by lions, leopards, hyenas. We had to defend our territories from unfriendly neighboring groups. Now, the desire to spot trouble actually still lingers within the human psyche, believe it or not. Now, perhaps understanding what's behind our preference for these large lawns will actually allow us to become more comfortable with less lawn and with more trees. I'm willing to bet that one or two more oaks on your lawn probably is not going to increase the chances any of us are going to get a chance by mortal, uh, attacked by mortal enemies. When planting one or more, uh, two, one or more oak trees on your property, however, something else is going to happen. What you're going to do is greatly enhance the wildlife value of your property. For example, one oak species alone can support over 534 species of butterfly and moth species. So really what you're doing is you're creating a little micro ecosystem on your larger scale. So, this doesn't look too bad, does it? Now, overall basic design concepts utilizing native plant species are actually the same when utilizing non-native plants. Planting small plants in front, uh, larger plants in the back. And during this process, along with trying to create a beautiful garden, you're really also trying to create some habitat for wildlife. And you're doing this by creating this heterogeneous <coughs> mixture. You can see all of these species are sort of spread evenly, distributed throughout. And you know, there's all these beautiful colors here, so it has its aesthetic value as well. So, um, yeah, native border gardens should also be as wide as possible and also as densely planted as possible because it's actually a good thing if you can't see the ground. They get caught up in mulching and with leaf litter sometimes, but if you can't see the ground, what you've actually done is you've succeeded in providing safe sites for wildlife that needs them. So nesting birds, chipmunks, amphibians, reptiles. However, keep in mind that leaving uh, a healthy forest floor in the shadier parts of your landscape, that's also an option too. We don't have to develop everything. We've been programmed to rake up every leaf and twig as it hits the ground, to try and force grass to grow, to try and make everything look perfect. And a lot of times grass was never meant to grow in these areas. So through sk uh, standard landscaping techniques, we actually lose a tremendous amount of value when we remove the leaf litter. This is because it provides many free services for us. It's free mulch, free fertilizer, free weed control, and free soil amendments. In addition, leaf litter also provides habitat for many of the arthropod, so the small insect predators, uh, that actually help to keep our garden communities ecologically balanced. And above all, a deep, a deep bed of leaf litter acts almost like a sponge. So it soaks up enormous quantities of water during downpours. When the rain stops, the leaf litter that has been allowed to accumulate slowly releases its moisture and that actually keeps the plants and the trees in your garden well hydrated. So even during dry periods, that will also reduce the amount of watering, actually allowing you to do less with landscape upkeep. Uh, so you might worry that leaf litter is going to make your landscape look all unkempt, but a good way to give native plantings a more formal appearance is to actually edge them neatly. So if you've dedicated a lot of your uh, yard to tree plantings, you can lay out a well-defined path for your lawn, that's an option, and even meadows, if you have a nice meadow in your front lawn, uh, they can be neatened by mowed paths and edges. Now, in landscaping with native plants, we're actually able to create habitats that they themselves fight global warming for us. The climatologists are now unanimous on three separate points. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
it slows the rate at which the sun, uh, sun's energy is lost from the atmosphere into space, and therefore it raises the temperature of the Earth's surface. There is now more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than at any time in the past 10 million years. And third, human consumption of fossil fuels has actually caused the increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide that we're currently experiencing. Now, together, these three facts suggest that it's to our benefit to reduce the production of carbon dioxide. Hacking our way through forests to plant huge expanses of lawn is a really poor way to go about this process. Trees in and of themselves are carbon sinks. So what does this mean? It, uses, they do, it means they use up carbon from the atmosphere to build their tissues and they keep the carbon locked up and out of trouble for hundreds of years. For example, one large sugar maple tree, just one tree, can sequester 450 pounds of carbon dioxide each year. So just think of the carbon emissions that we can offset if we just reversed our course and started to replace some of our 40 million acres of lawn with trees. Now, when we add the environmental costs of mowing our lawns, the benefits of rethinking this lawn mentality becomes even more obvious. If you're concerned about the human impact on our planet's climate, reducing the amount of lawn that you mow each week is probably one of the best things that you can do to reduce your family's carbon dioxide emissions. On average, mowing your lawn for one hour produces as much pollution as driving 650 miles. Moreover, we now burn 800 million gallons of gas every single year in our lawnmower engines just to keep our lawns perfectly manicured. And in all, we spend $45 billion every year on lawn maintenance alone. So converting lawn to trees or gardens not only is going to save us money and create much needed food and habitat for our wildlife, but it would also have a twofold benefit, producing less and absorbing more carbon dioxide. So win-win. When developing our native landscape, it's also important to build complexity and diversity. So creating the vertical structure of finding nature's own designs by using ground cover, shrub, understory, and canopy species, it's a great start. But we also have to remember animal diversity is a direct result of native plant diversity. So if we want to support a large diversity of wildlife, we must supply as many different species of native plants as possible. A good place to pack in the diversity is in hedgerows and border plantings. It's the perfect place for densely planted viburnums, beneath larger trees, chuckberries, azaleas. These are all things that we don't really see that much anymore, because unfortunately the deer populations have completely decimated their understories. All right, so by now, probably more than likely understand how important native plant species are to sustaining biodiversity and that adding plant biomass and diversity to your property is the key to supporting local wildlife. In all likelihood though, your neighbors probably do not. So that means it's up to you, it's up to us, to set an example. And it's also important that we understand their perspective, who might not be as educated, when we go to educate. Because most people have little to no formal exposure to ecology. Your neighbors might only have a vague notion of what biodiversity even is, and might be skeptical of the fact that as humans, we just, <coughs> excuse me, we cannot exist for long on this earth without the support of healthy ecosystems. So because of all this, we might not actually have an intuitive appreciation for the suggestions that we're making to them. Of course, it's unlikely you will immediately achieve your goal of convincing your neighbors that life begins with natives. And it's entirely possible they're only going to buy into this notion after you've shown them my example. So if we construct an attractive landscape primarily from native plants, you'll have at least begun this process. One way to enlist support from your neighbors is to give them ownership of the process of saving local wildlife. We could do much more to end the extinction crisis if everyone in the world became an, ad an advocate for just one species.
because assuming there's about nine million species of multicellular organisms on Earth, and with over six billion humans on the planet today, approaching seven billion, there could be over 670 people devoted to each and every species. So it's an interesting idea, but organizing the entire world kind of seems like a bit, you know, it's a bit of an uh, overwhelming undertaking, right? So why don't we just start with our own neighborhood? Many developments have civic associations that we can use to establish standards and rules for homeowners in the neighborhood. So let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. I'm sure we're all familiar with the monarch butterfly. Now, monarchs are in trouble for many reasons. For one thing, millions of these butterflies are hit by cars while en route to their overwintering site in Mexico. And unfortunately, these butterflies are also losing their overwintering sites. And until the political will to protect these monarchs' forest materializes, really the only hope that we have to protect the species is really in our own backyards every summer. So our towns, our civic associations, our communities can help monarchs in many ways. First, we can encourage others to include milkweeds. That's the only host species for reproducing monarch butterflies in private landscapes, public areas, libraries, schools. And you know, monarchs, like most herbivores, are actually limited in their availability to make more monarchs really by food availability. So if they don't have this host species, then really their species just doesn't stand a chance, unfortunately. So uh, neighborhood children could also be mobilized to keep records of monarch populations over the years, having our younger children get involved. And you know that starts to set a generational precedent overall. So it could be a competition. Whose milkweed garden is producing the most monarch butterflies? How many monarchs pass their specified checkpoints? Really, the list goes on and is only limited by our own creativity. So, overall, in closing, I'm hopeful to have painted a picture of the importance of native plant species as the key to planting the seeds for a healthy environment. Again, much like these growing social justice movements that are so important, education is only going to be the first step. All of us must lead by example and be the advocates for the change that we wish to see in our ecosystem and the world. And just as a mighty oak tree stands strong and secure, and how that began with a single acorn, the movement away from this thought of speciesism for the healthy environment begins with a single native seed. We can be the acorn. So I'd also like to take this opportunity to invite you all to reach out to both myself and to Restore Native Plants if you'd like to learn more. Uh, equally importantly, to help us and join the cause, like Caitlin here, she did an amazing job last summer. Um, so I'm going to conclude with that. Thank you all for your time. I'm free to answer any questions, and that's all. So that's actually us, believe it or not. We're the local landscapers. So yeah, we are uh, both the educators and the boots on the ground. Uh, we uh, help others to do, um, you know, really identifying what's on their property. Um, just over the past few years, uh, we've actually just this year we hit uh, 500,000, so half a million invasive species uh, removed, and um, we're over. I believe 65,000 plants planted. So we do the boots on the ground work, we do the education. Yeah, we do we do everything. So yeah, if you were interested. I was thinking about like a little community. Sure. Where we have a lot of visits and anyway, like, uh, you know, I guess you guys do kind of what we might have to say for, you know. Definitely, yeah, we, uh, so we have, uh, both um, expert arborists, we also have an invasive species technician who's certified with the state, who's able to identify everything. And um, yeah, so we would definitely be happy to come by, do a consult, identify things. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it, it's, uh, 
it's pretty depressing sometimes when you have your first console because you don't realize what you actually have, right? But that's again the first step. And yeah, I think it's I think it's great that you know you're interested and you're you're curious about it. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got a connection already. We're good. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, at this time, I'm happy to introduce Ms. Caitlin Stern, who's, um, who will be presenting on analyzing insect activity on native and invasive, uh, invasive plant counterparts. Caitlin? Native, invasive, or non-native. 
In non-native, it's just a term used to describe insects that originate from another region, but they're not causing any damage to the region. I live in the Red Square. The invasive plant counterparts can be seen, and they're the only counterparts that hosted invasive plant or invasive insect species. Whereas their native counterparts didn't host any invasive insects. So the significance shows that Rosa Carolina and Multiflora reflected the hypothesis. This is because the native rows had a higher richness of eagerness and sports more insects than life. The Las Pedazes, though, had a much more similar richness of eagerness. This is possible because insects have adapted to use the invasive plant. Las Pedazes Cunada has been in the United States for more than 100 years. During this time, insects could have learned to use it similarly to its native plant. And this could explain the similar amount of insects that have visited both. Uh, no invasive insects were seen visited the native plants, however, several visited the invasive ones. In fact, 8.7% and 19% of all insects that visited the invasive plants were invasive. This could be because the invasive insects originated from the same region as the invasive plants, like the invasive Haliomorpha lilies seen on the invasive plant Lespedes cuneata. Both species originated from Asia. The same way that native plants attracted native insects from their region, invasive plants attracted invasive insects from their region, all from Asia. Applications. Since Rosa Carolina was the most beneficial um, because it hosted the most insects and, uh, yeah, insect versions of eagerness. Its invasive counterpart, though, is of higher priority to be removed. This is because it had a lower richness of eagerness than its counterpart and it hosted more invasive species of insects. And these invasive insects cause damage for the entire ecosystem, so they there should not be provided a home. Um, Lespedeza cuneata, however, the invasive Lespedeza is of less priority to be removed, and this is because insects may have adapted to use it. Even though it did host invasive insects, it is still benefiting the ecosystem in some way, since the amount of insects uh, that visited it was similar to the amount that visited its native counterpart. To conclude, the research question of the study was how does the origin of a plant species affect the amount and types of insects that use it? By observing the amount of insects that visit each species, the answer was found. Rosa Carolina and Multiflora showed that the native counterpart hosted a higher insect richness and evenness. But Lesbeth, Virginica, and Pinata show, host, showed, um, hosted a similar insect, insect richness and evenness, and this is because insects may have adapted to use Lesbeth and Pinata. And in both sets of counterparts, the, native, the invasive plant hosted more invasive insect species, probably because they are from the same region. Uh, thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank my mentor, Jason, and Ms. Ms. Kosti, who helped me a lot, and anyone else who helped me with this project, so thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Go ahead. Um, just in general? Yeah, just, I'm just curious, like what all were you talking Okay, one of my favorites was um, the native spiny assassin bug right there. That one was pretty cool. And there's also this other native leaf hopper, which was really pretty. Um, and some of the invasive included uh, an invasive wasp, and I don't really remember. I, I found the insects in summer, so it was a long time ago. <laughs> I just kind of curious what you found. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Blake Kessler, who calculated Gini coefficients related to funding and J schools. for her education funding in HSC. So education funding has a pretty significant impact on the quality of education. So that means that quality and access to education funding is important to ensure people access to education. So we thought that there would be notable inequality in the funding schools, and we thought that this inequality would have relationships 
in statistically significant relationships with a set of statistics that we looked at, mainly to do with stuff like wealth and rates and educational achievement. So we were actually surprised by the fact that, as far as we found, nobody had ever used the gene coefficient to actually assess inequality in school funding. And very few people previously mathematically investigated using any methods the equality of education funding for such an important topic. So few people analyzed it. So my mentor and I decided that we were going to analyze it. The tool that we use to analyze it is called the Gini coefficient. It's basically a number between 0 and 1 that represents the amount of inequality in the system. So 0 would represent a perfectly equal system, no inequality, and 1 would represent a perfectly unequal system. And the way you calculate the gene coefficient is you, just, you calculate a curve to represent your data. We call it a lateral Lorentz curve. You can see over here is an example of the Lorentz curve. And then the, the most simple form of a Lorentz curve is what we call the line of perfect quality, which is basically just a straight diagonal line. We, that's an that's indication of a gene coefficient of zero, and we use it to calculate other gene coefficients. Because we to calculate the Gini coefficient, you get the area between your Lorentz curve and your in line of quality. You get a number between 0 and a half, double it, you get a number between 0 and 1, and that's the Gini coefficient. So we, we ran those Gini coefficients on each different county in New Jersey. We broke it up into its school districts and calculated how equally they have access to funding per student. And we found that. When you do that, breaking that by county, you get unique coefficients for each county of, at, at most 0 0.21 and at least 0 0.07. On average, you'll get around 0 0.13, give or take 0 0.03. And if you, if you don't break that by county and just calculate one for every single school district in, in New Jersey, you get a gene coefficient of 0 0.14. Looking on the right, you have, we just have a map of the data that we calculated. Just give you guys a second look at that. Back there. And here we also have a table of all our current county results. You can see that Huntington, for example, has the lowest Gini coefficient for education funding. For let's see, Mercer County has the highest. For Essex is roughly average. And Morris County, Morris County is actually a bit below average, just a bit more equal. Or you can see, you can see that the average up here. So we have to conclude that there was that we were wrong. There was no statistically significant inequality in education funding. The gene coefficient of zero point zero seven is remarkably low, and zero point eight two one is still very low. For for comparison, for income inequality in the United States, you get you calculate the gene coefficient for that, you get something like zero point four eight. That's more than double our highest gene coefficient, and way higher than our lowest one. So if you remember from before, we also wanted to calculate if, if what inequality we found would have any relationships with any other statistics. So the tool that we use for that is called R squared value, R squared coefficient. It's basically just a tool to measure linear relationships between two data sets. So it's again a number between zero and one. This time it represents the percentage of one variable that can be accounted for by another. So for example, this is this is actually one of the ones that we found. We got an R squared of 0.26 relating income inequality with education and funding inequality. And we, that would indicate that 26% of the differences in education and funding are related to, to the, the income inequality. And then here, here's all the statistics we tested. We tested different population, female population, white population, African American, Native and our Asian American, Hispanic population, and we tested high school graduation rate, college completion rate, median household income, poverty rate, and income inequality. And you can see that our highest ones were income inequality, and that the lowest ones were things like population and female population. And then, but that in general, we're seeing a lot of very low numbers on there. We also 
graph to make our data. I'm sorry, I did not make the labels large enough, but they're all not really showing me anything anyway. So it's, it's, you can see like over here on the top on the top left, that's the female population percentage graph. It's basically flat, there's nothing to look, there's nothing to have correlations with. Or on the bottom right, bottom left, sorry, you get the, the extended population, it just looks random, no relationship there either. Or if you look at if, if you look at income inequality, you can see that there is a slight upward trend, but it's very spread out still and very, very shallow. So that all still indicates a very weak relationship, if any at all. Pretty much all, all these graphs are like that. They're all either pretty much random, pretty much flat, or still very spread out. So we again had to conclude that we were wrong. There was no apparent relationship between the inequality in education funding that did exist and any of the statistics we tested. Our highest r square value that we found was 0 0.26. To be statistically significant, or in other words, to be at a level that it actually matters, that we can actually say this is a real effect, we need to have an r square value of at least 0 0.8, ideally at least 0 0.9. And that's like more than three times our any of the r square value that we found. So that indicates that we were wrong on both terms. There was either major inequality in access to education funding in New Jersey or any in New Jersey relationships between inequality and statistics we tested. It's in the case that New Jersey actually does a pretty good job. This doesn't apply. We didn't actually apply this research to anywhere else yet. We're going to be getting to that over the summer. But for New Jersey, we did a pretty good job. I would like to thank Professor Ashton Bayadev. A sharp person of the Montclair State University Mathematics Department, who unfortunately is not here at this place tonight. Wait, he is in the back. Got <laughs> and, and I would also like to thank Ms. Kowalski. Without them, you, without either of them, this would not have happened. Without the guidance, direction, and education of Professor Vaidia and Professor and Dr. Dr. Kowalski, none of this would have been happening. So, any questions? Yes? Uh, you yeah. said you were going to look at uh, other states. Do you uh, have any planned out already for the summer? So we're going to be probably looking at either New Mexico or Washington State first, because New Mexico have, is generally regarded as having the worst school system in the country, compared to New Jersey. That's regarded as one of the best. Or Washington State has one of your most regressive fiscal policies of any state in the country. So we figured that if, since we didn't find anything for one of the better school districts, or better school systems, we're probably going to find something with one of the worst ones. If we're going to find something like that, at least. Any other questions? In that case, we're now going to go to the big 15 minute intermission. We have refreshments in the lobby, we have snacks, we have that stuff. So we'll be right back. <laughs> I was so happy to receive her email. She's coming back. Yeah, she was excited. I was like, have you spoke? She's like, I should. I go get that. Thank you so much for oh, coming. Oh, no, you're, the time. you're welcome. I totally appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Yes, it's really I got halfway through. I'm like, I forgot my water. Mouth drawing out. Oh, Not good. sorry. You should give me the time. That's <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm and really if you need more recruits, let me know. I have, a, I think, at least three or four more coming No, up. always. <laughs> always, for real. Um, we're always looking for more people to come in, especially, you know, the, the younger students, because eventually they start to phase out. And, yeah. You know, we got lucky. 
Yeah, we got lucky. Like one of our our greenhouse manager right now, he started with us when he was thirteen, and he's twenty three now. So you know, certainly we'd love for them to stick around, but you know, we also realize some of them cycle through. So oh, I'm interrupting. This is Mr. Hi. This has been Mr. How P. Are you? This is good, Jason. Jason. Nice to meet you. Yeah, okay. How are you? Nice to meet you. That was amazing. I really oh, enjoyed you. that. Thank you. So. Um, did you have a card? Did you I do. Have something? Yeah. Uh, Actually, because I, I would definitely reach yeah. out. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I brought a couple with me. It's funny, um, I so rarely get to give them out, but, right. you know, especially for things like this, I'm so grateful to have them. And even our cards, like, they're tiny because like, yeah. we're trying to save paper. Save paper. Oh, yeah, it's perfect. And we planted yeah. trees for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that was, uh, I was really, you know, it, it's something that. You know, we try to address as much as I can in the sure. bio class yeah. that you know uh, Miss Watson does all the time, of course, in, in her class, and she's trying to get it through to them. So I'm just like sitting there going, "Oh, we could totally do this." Oh, so you should, maybe you should actually probably have you just come in and talk to our regular class. Uh, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd be happy I, I really to come in and we have like the AP environmentals, like, 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 like C bombs or something. Yeah, like you know, have yeah. to do something that's like. Hands on like that, if you can, yeah, get something like that going and just have them kind of around the around the campus and see how it goes. Yeah, and you know. and for anything too. I, I mean, you know, it's funny. Like I'm the head of restoring native plants now, but you know, my research was in, in wildlife bio. So I mean, oh, okay. I did. I worked with everything from zebrafish, turtles. Um, worked with uh, wolf puppies, trying to get them reintroduced into the Adirondack Park. I was doing uh, bird rehab, like wildlife rehab. With, <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, birds of prey. So oh, the, the questions on the Regents exam about the the wolf pups going <laughs> yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. The thing I use that that one every year sure. when we're doing graphing, and the, the the first we start off on that one. Yeah, yep. So I, I definitely I, I enjoyed it, and and looking at the big picture and just trying to chug out ideas and going, how can we get yeah, stuff yeah. going on around here? Absolutely. Because I'm in West Milford too, and that's okay. the reason that we moved there, was sure. because yeah. it was so much nicer than in Rockland, where they just built yeah. things on every available right. piece of land that they had. Mm -hmm. So, um, your website or anything, does it have like a... Excuse me, I just want to just make sure oh, it's nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you, in case you skewed out before okay. you <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, do you guys have like a, a guide or anything like that, or you you kind of like, hey, these are like a flash, some of the things that you could grab. So, so you know, not on the website. We mm -hmm. were primarily concerned people were either going to misuse it or misinterpret it or something. Right, right, right. That said, if anybody reaches out to us, we're happy to provide stuff. Okay, you know, cool. Again, I'm happy to you know come in person and speak to the class. Yeah, right. definitely yeah, for sure. Um, so now that I have that, I'll I'll definitely be in touch and let you know. We're this year was just. Oh, I understand. A train wreck, so I'm just waiting for next year, so that way I can... Of course. I, I had to start with the scientific method, and that took from September to, like, December. I'm like, I'm like really, guys? Like, we're, we're still... And they're like, well, you know... We freshman or... Square. I like the freshmen because I get to whip them into shape <laughs> before they go into the other high school shit, before they go into the other, That's you know... Good. Yeah, because, Yeah, sure. They're just, they go over to the gas valves and they're like, what's this? You know, and like, you gotta like, yeah. really get on them about all that stuff. So I try to get them ready for when they move up to the upper level classes. Yeah, at least they're not chewing on the lab tables and, you know, you know yeah. all that stuff. So. Sure. And if you want to send people our way too, like over the summer or whatever. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, we, we take safety incredibly seriously here. Yeah. So like... What I like to tell people is like, yeah, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff. You want to take safety incredibly seriously, and you know, it, it's I feel like it's a safe environment for parents to send their kids to. Like, right. I don't want to say there's not a lot, but it's like it's almost few and far between now. Even when I was growing up in the '90s, like it's not the same as it was. You know, so. I remember that's again like, when I grew up. Uh, Eighties and nineties, and you know, we used to just walk around. When I was a kid, and there was the empty lots in Rockland, and we were like, yeah. so at least the Highlands Act over here it makes yeah. it so much more difficult for anybody to get anything. Mm -hmm. So we're right by uh, Pine Cliff Lake. Okay, yeah, we're right off of Larson and Honor Hill. Okay, right I'm, yeah. I'm right. Uh, the greenhouse right across yeah, from yeah. the from the, the post office. Yeah. I'm right over there. Okay. Yeah. Um so like that's you know, we're we're just trying to 
I'm constantly outside doing the landscaping, doing whatever. Sure. If I can do something to help out, then I'll do something to help out. Of course, yeah. Too. Yeah, that's so. Cool. The more information I have, the better. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I know you're you're probably close to farmers at this point. Obviously. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Roughly. So yeah, I mean, even if you don't reach out like right now, even over the yeah. summer, you want help with anything? Like, you want to incorporate me into something yeah. that I'm happy to do? Absolutely. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much. It's Thank nice you. Meeting. You're doing such great work. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's, it's 
So um, with the ghost forest effect increasing, there's going to be more trees that are going to be dying. So this loss of trees is going to reduce the carbon storage that they are able to provide. And the ghost forest effect will be forming a lot faster with climate change itself bringing more storm surges. So this picture just demonstrates how the ecosystem is changing over time. So this picture on the left, clearly it's thriving, it has a high uh, biodiversity. And then from B, then you can see how slowly it's being impacted by the increase in sea levels with the ghost force effect. To then C, completely all the way on the right, um, that is the complete ghost force effect happening on the ecosystem. So uh, part of my study, I did the ANOVA test. So I'm now going to just briefly speak about what that is. So it's basically a statistical test that's used to compare different groups. So in this sense, uh, it's comparing different tree species that were used against each other. From there, uh, this is going to basically prove a conclusion that can be observed. Uh, this is going to show statistical variance in groups. So for this study, um, we did this for the final heights of the trees after the study was completed. So some key results from that ANOVA test. Um, five out of eight of the trees were greatly impacted by the increase in salinity, which is proving some significance. And um, out of the other three that were good, Little Oak was the most successful, that had the least amount of impacts, making it the most successful based on high growth alone for the test. So now getting to more rock analysis here. Um, this first table here is going to be talking about the final biomass of the species that was selected at the harvest. So um, this graph basically shows different salinities on different tree species. So we have different levels of salt here. So all the colorful lines represent uh, zero parts per trillion of salt, five, 10, 15 parts per trillion of salt. Um, so the, uh, on the right here, you can see table, uh, all the species that are in the red are the ones that were the most impacted by the increase in salinity. So um, that basically means that their control variable that had zero amounts of salt added was the highest because it was the most successful against um, the other ones compared to so the most successful out of this group was JD, which was the eastern red cedar, and QP, which was the willow oak. So that's being represented here by those black arrows. Now getting into the final head species, a little more graph analysis here. Um, same kind of process here with the different salinities used with different colors. So the most effective tree species in this category were pitch pine and eastern red cedar, along with willow oak. So those are yet again being represented by those black arrows. Getting to some future work now. So as I mentioned before, climate change is an increasingly growing issue. So with that, it's important to further that research, along with sea levels rising, and to note that and then figure out how that's going to affect us in the future. Um, also testing other areas in the world, along with other tree species, to see how that can change over time. As I mentioned before, the study was only relevant to New Jersey, so continuing research around the world is really, really important. These pictures here um, showcase how different areas on the left here with the United States and then on the right the rest of the world is going to be impacted by an increase in sea levels. So those red areas are going to be the areas that are going to be most impacted. So these areas should be areas that we should look to, um, you know, do different experiments here and see how they're going to be greatly impacted in the future. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I'd like to give you a thank you to Ms. Kay, of course, and my mentor, Dr. Danziger, who is from Omni University. Um, I'll take any questions at this time, but if not, thank you again for listening. Yes? I was just wondering, um, what areas in New Jersey do you think the sea levels are rising from? Um, obviously more south. So this was mostly done around the Monmouth University area, which is near like Ocean County, kind of down in that area. So mostly just along the coast. Southern New Jersey, I would definitely say, is the most um, at risk here at this point. Yes. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, as the temperatures are increasing, water is rising, it's just an issue all around, uh, which is why I mentioned before it's important to always continue that research and look at more areas such as that um, in the future, of course. So, yes. Any other questions? Thank you guys. So, that is up for me. Uh,
Hello guys. Uh, hello. Hello. Okay, so my name is Louis Weibel, and I'm here to present to you about trends in overall health predicting COVID-19 vaccination status. And my mentor was completed um, but with Dr. T. Jeter, who resides in Georgia. So first up, my research question was, is there a relationship between one's vaccination status and common chronic medical problems? And we theorized that healthy people are more likely to be vaccinated than unhealthy people. And our outcome showed exactly that. So the first step of our procedure was that Dr. Jeter provided me with a de-identified data set according to the HIPAA regulations and assisted in identifying the standards for healthy and abnormal. For this study, a person who only received one vaccination was considered not immune due to the lack of efficacy that only one vaccine provides. Then I graphed the percent of the vaccinated and unvaccinated populations by abnormal or healthy levels of each variable and drew conclusions from those graphs. So here we have our first graph, which is the vaccination status based on sex and age. So in the blue, you can see that it is represented by uh, the female population. And then you can see the gray is represented by the male population. So figure one looks at the relationship between sex and COVID-19 vaccination status. And here you can see that 17.2% of females in the total population are not vaccinated, whereas 20.3% of the females in the total population are vaccinated. Along with this, 28.10% of males in the total population is not vaccinated against COVID-19, whereas 34.3% of males in the total population are vaccinated against COVID-19. So this shows that males are more likely to be vaccinated than females in this uh, data set, and females are more likely to not be vaccinated than males. So in figure two, you're looking at the relationship between COVID-19 vaccination status, and that is combined with the average age of males and females. And it shows that the average age of people that are not vaccinated is 37.4, whereas the average age of people who are vaccinated is 46.3. And this indicates that people who are older are more likely to be vaccinated rather than not vaccinated. So this is really getting into what my study looked at, which is using different health variables to determine whether COVID-19 vaccination status had an effect on them. So this graph looks at the vaccination status versus cholesterol levels. In the blue, you can see represented by the vaccine image that that population is vaccinated and the gray is not vaccinated. So this graph looks at abnormal and normal cholesterol levels to one's vaccination status. And here, abnormal and normal cholesterol levels are determined if a patient had greater than 200 in their cholesterol level. There are more healthy people than there are vaccinated, as you can see here. There's 38, that, which is the 38%. Um, the non-vaccinated population, which is 26.2%. And although there are more vaccinated people that have hyperlipidemia, which is a higher cholesterol level, um, there is a larger percent of the unvaccinated population with hyperlipidemia. The next graph is looking at vaccination status and blood pressure. Here um, it is an abnormal blood pressure is defined as 130 over 90. And here people who are vaccinated are more likely to be healthy than not to be healthy. And among those with hypertension, which is the higher blood pressure level, more people were vaccinated than unvaccinated. And once again, blue represents the vaccinated population and gray represents the unvaccinated population. And here we can see, this is uh, asking about vaccination status with diabetes, and this was measured using A1C. And if the patient had a A1C greater than 6.4, then they were determined to have diabetes and be considered unhealthy in this population. Here, more people that were healthy were considered to be vaccinated than unhealthy. And amongst those with diabetes, more people were vaccinated than unvaccinated. And on our last graph, we have vaccination status in the setting of multimorbidity. So multimorbidity is defined as the presence of multiple diseases or medical conditions. And health status was uh, decided by whether a person had one out of three, two out of three, or three out of three abnormal health levels, or if they were completely healthy or having none of them. Figure six, which is this figure right here, shows that the people who are healthier are more likely to be vaccinated than people who are unhealthy. As you can see, people who are healthy are more likely to be vaccinated rather than not vaccinated. People who are slightly unhealthy 
are more likely to be vaccinated, not vaccinated, that's the one out of three group. People who are moderately unhealthy are more likely to be vaccinated rather than unvaccinated, which is the two out of three group. And people who have multimorbidity, which is determined as three out of three chronic medical conditions, are less likely to be vaccinated rather than not vaccinated. So here, this is extremely important because it's showing a downward trend in vaccination status as you have more of these chronic medical issues. So for my discussions and conclusions, uh, firstly, people with healthy levels of cholesterol, normal blood pressure levels, and normal blood sugar levels were more likely to be vaccinated against COVID-19. And overall, more males were vaccinated when compared to the female counterparts. And amongst those with these chronic diseases, such as hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes, more people were vaccinated than unvaccinated. However, those with multimorbidity, reflecting those with the highest risk of severe consequences of viral respiratory illnesses, such as COVID-19, were least likely to be vaccinated. So here are a couple of areas of, of opportunities that will most likely be exploring next year. We have, in this study, we had a very small uh, population size because my mentor was just starting her private practice and we only had 64 people um, involved in this study. We were also geographically limited to one state, which is Georgia, and also one country in the United States. So these results can depend on not only the climate of the state, but also the country. So to fix some of these um, issues, some future research that can occur is adding a larger sample size, possibly a couple hundred people, and maybe including more than one state. So maybe Georgia and a state from the north to see if there's any correlation between geographical areas. And you can also include more uh, variables. We only included one, which are three, which was uh, diabetes, blood pressure, and A1C levels. And we could possibly include uh, BMI and smoking status because those would both affect uh, how a respiratory illness um, can negatively impact it. So thank you guys for listening to my presentation. I wanted to give a special thanks to my mentor, Dr. Jeer, along with Ms. Kowalski and Ms. Rinaldi for guiding me through my project, um, along with a thank you to everyone else who helped me along the way. And are there any questions? Yes? Um, I'm just curious, these people with the group thing, mm -hmm. So those were from the 64 people who went to go see the doctor, and that's what the study looked at. It was only the data set which included the 64 people. Now these results could be different, um, but since we had a smaller population size, it was really just whoever went to that doctor's office. And just out of curiosity, what is your opinion? It blows my mind, honestly, the people with the most risk were the ones that didn't get vaccinated. What are your conclusions from that? Um, although that is out of the scope of the study, my personal belief it is possibly a uh, lack of health education um, because I'm sure if they did know that something was going to help prevent uh, further infection or possibly death, then they would most likely help them and get that vaccination. Are there any other questions? All right, next up, I will be introducing our senior, Sydney Hayden. So I'm Sydney Caden, and I'm obviously the senior. Uh, so my project was Utilizing Food Waste for Sustainability in Quinoa Township. So basically this was just a case study about quinoa and their food waste tendencies and how that impacts the environment. So why food waste? 40% uh, of all food created is thrown away in New Jersey. So that equates to about 63 tons of food per year thrown away in landfills and only 32% of that is diverted from landfills. So the reason we want to keep it out of those landfills is because when organic waste is sent there, it breaks down and emits landfill gas, which consists of methane and carbon dioxide. Methane has a high warming power, so it contributes greatly to climate change. Also, when waste is sent to landfills, the organic potential of the waste is gone to no longer be utilized. So here you can see a diagram of a landfill. The way 
case goes in a hole in the ground and it's covered with a cap, but gas still can leak out, which obviously is an issue, closes the environment. So where we want to put the waste is in an anaerobic digester. Uh, it's where organic waste can be put to be utilized, where waste can be turned into energy, uh, also called biogas. This will cut down on the amount of fossil fuels burned also because you won't be you won't need to mine fossil fuels if you're using biogas. There is government action taken about this. The A2371 bill, it was enacted in October. If an area disposes of 52 tons or more of organic waste yearly, it must be reutilized. And this can be through or anaerobic digestion or using a sample feed or other means. So here's a di diagram of an anaerobic digester. The organic food or organic waste gets sent there, gets turned into biogas, and can be used for a number of different things like power, stimulating the gas grid, to transport fuel, or even heat. So my question was how an imp the implementation of an anaerobic digester would impact the amount of carbon emissions in a suburban town. Because when organic waste is in the landfills, it's not being efficiently realized. We're just literally throwing the food away and the energy away. Also, landfill gas is emitted and contributes to global warming. So, uh, for my project, I wanted to find the effectiveness of an anaerobic digester in minimizing carbon and methane emissions from the breakdown of organic waste in suburban towns. So that was a lot, but I'm just minimizing the carbon and the greenhouse gases that goes into the atmosphere. Uh, and this town, it's in a different way you can do that. So I figured that if organic waste is diverted from landfills, then the impact that the waste has on climate change will lessen. And I was like, um, so to do this, I contacted different areas in the town. I split the town into three parts, the town council members about the residences, the grocery store manager about the supermarket in town, and the cafeteria director about the school space because they all go to different food waste or regular solid waste uh, haulers. So here's a picture of the waste in the school. You can see it's mostly um, school lunches. So with this information, I calculated the tons of food from these three different sectors, um, either through like statistics, if you, we had the amount of solid waste, we could calculate the food waste, or if we had the number of lunches sold in the cafeteria, we could calculate the uh, weight of each sandwich and sort of average it out. And the grocery store, it gave us statistics, how much is donated, how much is recycled, how much is thrown away. I use those calculations to find the total organic waste generated by the whole town. So how much could be sent to an anaerobic digester? How much is being sent to a landfill? I also found the projected residential waste based on the um, population, as well as the actual residential waste based on the amount of solid waste picked up. The landfill gas emissions from landfills. So how much we put into the atmosphere? The methane gas emitted from an anaerobic digester and landfills, as well as the possible biogas produced by an anaerobic digester and the possible energy from that biogas. So here's the weighing sandwich to sort of average out the weight, see how much waste, food waste this school contributes. So here are some of the results for landfills. Uh, you can see the food waste projected and actual and from the school's grocery store and the total. The, bio, the biogas made from that and the amount of methane, which is 55%, you can see highlighted is 2,000 or 2 million about uh, standard, cubic, standard cubic feet of methane to make from the residences, and that largely gets leaked out into the atmosphere. Uh, Kimon totally produces 289 tons uh, into the atmosphere yearly. So, that's how much we contribute to climate change. If we send our food to an anaerobic digester, the residences would contribute more like two and a half million 
uh, starting to proceed with methane, and that would all be able to be reutilized to power our homes. Uh, you can see the actual kilowatt hours of average number of homes that would be able to heat here, about 880,000 kilowatt hours per year. If we send all our food to an air work digester, that would be about 108 homes. So here you can see that it was projected the residences would create more waste than we actually did, which is pretty impressive. We create less waste. The schools were pretty unimportant in this little study, and the grocery store was a big chunk of it, which was surprising. See the amount of electricity generated from the anaerobic digester and landfill. There's a lot more from an anaerobic digester. And in landfills, 75, only 75% can be reutilized, 25% of it is sell. But in an anaerobic digester, all of it can be reutilized. So, even though Kimon does produce less food waste than the national average per person, Kimon still contributes 289 tons of methane emissions yearly because of leakage from landfills. And residences are the largest contributor of the waste. Could we send it to an anaerobic digester? About 880,000 kilowatt hours of electricity could be generated, and it would heat about 180 homes. So, future action that can be taken is school supermarkets and residences should store separated waste, meaning they separate organic waste from regular waste, just like they separate recyclables. Town outreach programs can be created to educate residences about this, like a seminar or a poster downtown. Also, individual residences can do composting or alternate means of food waste disposal. And even town decision makers can opt to send waste to recycling centers rather than landfills. So in the future, we know that this is an ecological good thing, sending it to an aerobic digester, but we don't know the economic impact, so that should definitely be researched. And finally, I'd like to thank my mentor, and Ms. Falsky and my parents, my friends, for coming here. Uh, yeah, it's been a good three years in this program. So, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, not that I know of. I think they would send it to a facility outside of the town. Yeah, there's definitely one in New Jersey. I don't know exactly where, though. Okay. Any more? Okay, and back to Ms. Falsky then. As you can see, they all work really hard. I'm extremely proud of all of them. I can't believe what we went through this year. I really, really can't. <laughs> but we had a great time, and they were a great crew to work with. And I thank you all, the parents and mentors, and everyone who supported all of them and me throughout this year. Thank you all. Have a fantastic night, and I look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you.